what we see when we're looking for those revenue cycle improvements, that most of these relationships tend to break down around the communication. Being in the cardiovascular space, there's definitely areas that require a level of expertise that's hard to maintain in-house. When it comes to cardiovascular care, on the organizational level, MetaAxiom, an ACC company, understands the challenges your program is facing. Welcome to MetaAxiom Heart Talk, the podcast where thought leaders come together for one ultimate goal, to continually transform and optimize cardiovascular care for all. MetaAxiom Heart Talk starts now. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Cheryl Toth. If there's one thing that everyone in healthcare can agree on, it's the fact that billing and coding is complicated. It requires specialized knowledge, the codes change every year, every payer has different rules, and the amount of detail is dizzying. And all of this is leading some programs and practices to consider outsourcing their revenue cycle management services. In fact, the move from in-house to outsourced revenue cycle management grew 48% from 2015 to 2019. So maybe you're a physician or administrator who's fed up with billing headaches and ready to call it quits and outsource. Maybe you're in the midst of evaluating an outside service, or maybe you're frustrated with the billing service or MSO you already use. Today, we'll be addressing many of the issues you're facing, as well as discuss the pros and cons of outsourcing. And our guest to talk about this is Nicole Knight, Vice President, Revenue Cycle Solutions at Medaxium. And her decades of healthcare experience include not only revenue cycle and coding, but practice operations, clinical management, and practice management in cardiovascular and neurology settings. Nicole, welcome to Medaxium Heart Talk. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So what do you think is driving this trend toward outsourcing? What are you seeing in the field? What are you hearing out there? Well, I think the biggest thing that I'm hearing out in the field is that what's driving organizations to move towards this outsourcing is that they're having so many issues hiring and retaining the expertise in these areas. And also, from a billing and coding perspective, it's turned into a virtual world. So several of the programs want their staff to be in-house. And most of these folks now can work remotely. So they have a lot more competition in recruiting folks mm. for these positions for these particular roles. Well, and, and so what are you seeing in terms of um, the kind of practice or, or program that's a good candidate for outsourcing? That they're, they're experiencing high turnover. They're, uh, I guess maybe people are leaving because they're finding better paying opportunities with some of these virtual companies? Yes, and definitely we do see a lot of our private practice members of Medaxium and it just in general, the private practice community, that they do outsource a lot of these simply because they're not able to scale and they don't have the resources available or those expertise. When you look at hospital systems, it seems they're looking at this in order to just do that, to scale their staff and to have those resources available to them to turn things around quickly without having those gaps in staffing and the challenges around the training costs and all of those things that they're going through to bring those people into their system. So they're scaling up and they've got the, um, the opportunity with I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you know, the deeper pockets of a health system than a private practice to be able to bring in the expertise and to offer the benefits and the compensation that keeps people on board longer? Correct. And I think we are seeing that some of those systems do outsource portions of their mm. revenue cycle. Okay. They may not outsource all of their revenue cycle, but they may outsource some of those key portions such as coding or um, some of the authorization processes we've seen outsourced or patient collection. So there may be portions of the revenue cycle that we see systems outsourcing just because of the same things that the private practices are going through from recruiting and retaining that expertise. 
but from a private practice perspective, it's truly they're looking at that for that whole solution um, to be able to help them manage and stay in that private practice world. So what you're saying is this, uh, things are specializing. So even if it's the health system or hospital, they're outsourcing maybe particular pieces to the specialized um, types of companies. You mentioned pre-authorization, the coding. Uh, tell us about that in terms of are those individual companies that do, for example, coding services or the collections, are they all different? Are they knitting together different types of services to accomplish the whole revenue cycle? Yes, absolutely. We see where um, several of the hospital systems, especially, use many different third-party vendors, some that may support their specialty coding, such as cardiovascular, orthopedics, neurology, uh, that they outsource for that particular expertise. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to patient collections, the cost to collect once it gets to that patient level, um, if you don't have a very good front end process, it costs a lot to keep that in house. So really outsourcing that patient collections and really basing what you're gonna collect on that percentage of what you feel that company can go after. Well, and how are you seeing MSOs fit into this? Because in the early days of MSOs, the MSO used to do all the pieces. How do they fit into this new world order, if you will, of the, you know, the different specialized areas? Yes, I think what we're running into is that MSOs, we're seeing some MSOs that say, you know, we have to provide the full solution, meaning you have to use our electronic systems to process your claims. Uh, some even you have to use their EHR system. And then we're seeing these, what I would consider a hybrid MSOs that say, here is a laundry list of services we can provide and we can utilize your systems, but we do have the expertise to be able to provide the certain management services that you may need help with. So I think we're seeing both of those. It's pretty infrequent where um, we don't see that there are systems that want to, especially large health systems that are not going to want to use their EHR or their practice management platform because their entire system is using that. Yeah. And normally they want that, that MSO to come in and be able to use their system. Yeah. So they would, they would have to, in order to play in that, in those large organizations, the organization um, the, the outsourced organization knows they've got to use use the EMR practice management system. Correct. Um, Correct. Well, so let's talk about the what programs need to consider when they're outsourcing. What are your thoughts about planning and avoiding pitfalls? And give us give us your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think the biggest thing when you're considering outsourcing, it's important to first focus on what is that communication and reporting feedback loop? Because what we see when we come in and look at organizations and we're looking for those revenue cycle improvements, especially that most of these relationships tend to break down around the communication. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say really having a foundational structure of what you want to see from a reporting perspective and what your expectations are um, from a communication perspective. And then I think lastly, it would be the amount of staff that you will still have to maintain internally to manage that outsourcing relationship because you do have to have someone on your team that is keeping their finger on the pulse and managing that relationship and ensuring that there are no gaps or black holes within the process. Yeah, so I guess a program should think about how much money am I really saving if I've got to have people internally. I mean, I assume that that's something practices are looking at saving some money outsourcing, but they've got to be realistic about what the setup is going to be. Correct. And that accountability on your staff side to be able to manage that relationship. A lot of times we see where some of these relationships happen and you're outsourcing and then no one really owns that process anymore internally. So you kind of lose sight of what's happening. And that's really what I would say is one of the biggest pitfalls. It's all around that communication and having someone own that internally. So what would that look like to you in a, in a best case 
world? Who, who would own the relationship and how would they communicate? How frequently, how would that work well? Yeah, so what I see work well there is when you have, um, you know, it can be depending on the size of the organization, it could be a team of one to five folks that own portions of this relationship internally and are responsible for reporting to executive leadership on how the third party is performing and what are the results we're seeing. And then also to continue to monitor the cost of it versus our revenue so that mm -hmm. we know that what we're doing really is yielding results. Um, and then if it's requiring more and more resources on, on your staff internally, you definitely wanna be able to measure that uh, what I would expect to see uh, from an organization is that they have someone on their end who is providing touch points and re providing reporting tools, uh, especially if it's for your complete revenue cycle, that you're seeing at least monthly some key performance indicators that they're meeting and that they're also have some quality assurance things in place for their organization that they're reporting back to you on. Well, and what do you see in terms of the technology being used or the coding process or the charge capture process? Again, sort of best practice, what is the most efficient way that you see that handled when people outsource? Yeah, I do think that operating on the practice or the program or health systems IT platform um, does definitely yield more success than having to utilize a third-party software or an additional software where you're doing extra or re rework. So yeah, that, that'd be double you work, wouldn't work, it? You're saying like yeah, double work exactly. because, yeah, in your organization, you're using one thing and then you have to use the billing services. That's not ideal. Correct. So if your workflow is causing a lot of rework or if you're having to resort to paper processes when you've been electronic, or that there's issues around interfaces and things like that, and it's requiring more steps on your internal staff part to provide the data. I think that's where I see um, that, you know, those pitfalls occur there um, is when they have those gaps in that technology or in the workflow of paper versus electronic processes. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to wonder, who is the ideal candidate uh, for outsourcing, you know, thinking about the workflow and their systems. If, if, if is there like a best case program or practice that's like ripe for, hey, this really would work well for you? What comes to mind? I really, I really do believe those private practice physician groups that are less than 15 physicians who have remained private and not integrated into a health system and are truly trying to optimize their resources and their revenue, and also to look for opportunities, um, I do believe that using an MSO service is a great alternative for them. Great, and, and so let's say, let's take that maybe as an example. When they're assessing the qualifications of the outsourced billing service or MSO, how, how do they do that? So let's say they've decided this is a good opportunity, we need to shop around, what questions should they ask? What qualifications should they be looking for? In, in addition to the, like the one you said, they should allow the, the practice to use the same software that they're currently using. What else? They should definitely look at their reputation. Um, you know, we're in an electronic virtual world now. You can get many reviews online for a lot of these companies. I also suggest that, you know, many of them will provide references, um, but in the physician world, especially if you're in uh, cardiovascular specialties, uh, the community is smaller than you think, so your physicians may know someone in groups that are utilizing them, mm -hmm. and I think the more you can connect and really understand with people who have, are using their current system and utilizing their services and, and understanding what those pitfalls may be or those issues may be that they're having. Um, so I think reputation is definitely something. I also think they're specialty driven. If they have not worked in a certain specialty and that they're taking you over and you're the first one, or if it's a new process, 
I also caution everyone to um, discuss if they're using a third-party vendor within their organization that provides services out of the country because we have seen um, where there's technology challenges and just some obstacles to overcome there. Mm -hmm. So you want to consider that as well. There were two questions as you kind of research these qualifications and, and talk to re references, maybe two questions you would ask, what would those be if you're assessing a service? Um, what I would ask is, um, what do you guarantee your collection rate, your denial rate, and your accuracy of charge capture coding to be? And what is your expectations to manage that within your internal team? Excellent. That was a really good question. Because um, data doesn't, you know, the actual data <laughs> doesn't lie. So that's, that is an excellent question. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of folks may not think about asking that. So that's great. I'm also curious about what you would ask about the type of training that the staff who work for these organizations should have. I mean, how would you assess that and what kind of questions could I ask about those folks in terms of their certifications and their ongoing development to make sure that they are going to do a good job for my practice. Right. I would definitely inquire about their certifications if they are certified. And then also what is their minimum years of experience? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are several levels to certification and I'm a firm believer just because you uh, take a coding test and you become certified doesn't automatically mean that you can code for all all things. So what exactly is their experience level of their team? Um, and, you know, do they have a measure for their turnover within? Okay, good. Data and privacy concerns. Any risk areas that practices or programs need to be concerned with there in terms of how they manage them? You know, I have to say my experience has been the majority of these third parties um, definitely are positioned to where they are following all of the HIPAA guidelines and all of those rules. And of course, on your end, um, you know, everything that's required still has to remain intact. And I really believe that most folks do have those intact. So I don't think the privacy issue is that relevant anymore just because everyone follows those guidelines in order to operate and practice in that space. You definitely have to be in tune to those things. Mm -hmm. um, the technology barriers can just seem to be to connectivity. So um, understanding their connectivity and how they're utilizing their resources if they're all virtual um, how do they have access to everything and what is their, you know, is there any downtimes and those types of things. Great. So, well, that's a piece of good news as we go into the break about privacy and HIPAA concerns aren't as, uh, as much of an issue as they were a couple years ago. So read your business associate agreement, of course, but, you know, it sounds like they're following, most of these outsourced companies are following, following the right um, guidelines. That's great. I'd like to stop here and we'll take a break and we will be right back with Nicole Knight. Don't go away. Are you an administrator or clinician looking to advance cardiovascular care and optimize your organization? MedAxiom Academy is designed for you. Featuring courses led by industry experts, MedAxiom Academy educates and empowers the entire CV care team to succeed in today's rapidly changing healthcare environment. Plus, MedAxiom Academy is new and improved with an enhanced user experience, new features, and additional courses are coming soon. Learn more at medaxium.com forward slash academy, medaxium.com forward slash academy. We're back and we're talking with Nicole Knight, MedAxium Vice President, Revenue Psycho Solutions, about the pros and cons of outsourcing the billing. So Nicole, what should the practice expect from a billing service in terms of the reports and analysis and expertise? We've talked about the fact that there needs to be a point person for good communication and that they, you should know what kind of um, 
uh, denial rates and things like that, all of those get, get into the performance. So specifically now, tell us about some of the uh, reports and expertise that also contribute to a well-performing outsourced service. Yes, I think um, from a reporting perspective, what I would say is you want to be sure that they're keeping the key performance indicators that you've maintained for your program or your practice intact. So an example of that would be your charge lag. Um, we see charge lag generally go anywhere from three to 10 days, depending on the practice. Um, when we talk about that, it's taking into consideration office and hospital charges, but you wanna be sure that your partner definitely measures that charge lag and that there's no increased delay based on them having to access your system or get access to any documentation. And if there is, how do they communicate that back to you? Also, I believe that having the expertise in the coding, again, around their certification, their years of experience, especially if they're doing um, invasive surgical procedures and really having that um, expertise that they're able to provide not only just the coding back to you, but also education and opportunities that they can identify for your providers. Let's talk a little bit about coding. How should a revenue cycle service be involved in that part of the process? I mean, should they be doing it? Should you, the practice or program keep it in-house? How does, how does that work? I believe that um, the coding is, the, is a crucial part that impacts the providers directly. And of course it impacts revenue for the overall entity. The providers are impacted because most of them are paid on or compensated on work RVUs. Mm -hmm. Well, your work RVUs are related to your coding. So it's very important that the physicians have confidence that those codes are captured accurately and that the person who is capturing those codes has that expertise. And for the entity, of course, it's that have we captured and billed for all of the services we're providing in order to collect the revenue for our bottom line. Well, and what happens if the billing service finds a coding error? How is that best handled when you're in an outsourcing situation? The best way that I've seen that handled is if, if the provider is submitting their codes and it goes to a third party and the third party is coding from the documentation. And if there is a discrepancy um, from what the provider coded and what the coder is gonna code, that you have that open communication feedback to the provider to say, you build for this service or you coded this service and this is the reason we're not able to code it or that it shouldn't be coded because that's definitely what develops that trust and that relationship. And then the, the physician gets to make that modification, but not the coder, him or herself. Would that be right? In, in a best case Well, there's scenario. a communic, yeah, it's a communication around it. And of course, if it's whatever's acceptable from a regulatory perspective, it's generally where that lands. But I think it's the communication's important because the provider is thinking he's billing for a service that may not necessarily need to be billed for. So I think that communication is very important. So I'm curious when you talk about this communication and all of these great steps in this process as you explain them, is that something that MedAxium offers in its coding services line? Yes, absolutely. So Medaxium does provide cardiovascular coding services. We do it both on an interim basis and also from a long-term engagement. And really when we're providing that, we are working with you internally, both your providers and the staff that you have available that focus on this to really develop that relationship, that communication, to help that program continue to grow. Um, we definitely have found that being in the cardiovascular space, there's definitely areas within electrophysiology, vascular cases, 
and some of our structural heart services that require a level of expertise that's hard to maintain in-house. So we've really worked hard at MedAxium to develop a team that is able to support that and really focus on the cardiovascular space. Well, and what also sounds really effective is this, you're, you're, you're constantly coming back to that communication, educating, supporting the information going you know, back and forth, explaining to the provider and explaining to the staff. And that's what's so important. And the fact that you offer such deep expertise in cardiovascular services and have a national perspective must bring um, a good deal of value to the clients that utilize those services. Absolutely. And it definitely is a long-term relationship. And it's great to see those programs be successful. Well, and so if, if the um, practice or program has decided, okay, we're going to do this outsourcing thing, we've, we've looked at the reputation, we've asked about their, uh, their data points and their metrics and everything's a go, we picked these guys. What about the transition process, moving the billing out? What have you seen uh, out there in the field that you could help people learn from these lessons? Don't do this or do that as far as making that transition smooth. Yeah, I think the transitions um, definitely, uh, you know, it probably goes back to that thing we've repeated over and over again. It's to have a great project plan in place. Mm -hmm. so that you know when things are transitioning over and you're able to measure that success. Um, you don't want, for example, you to transition your claims processing to this third party without ensuring that your clearinghouse has been set up for them to submit to, that they're able to get those reports back that the claims went through successful, or that what are any of those errors? Because if you don't know if your claims are going through or if that contract hadn't been set up in place with your clearinghouse, that's where I've seen some hiccups happen mm. and you don't want to delay your claims process. So yeah. really having that project plan and what steps are going to happen and if there's some testing that occurs prior to totally flipping the switch over to that third party. What percent would you say is a fair service fee for these kinds of services? The, uh, I, I, get, I wonder if there's maybe a fee for the full service and the hybrid. There may be differences, but is there a range that you see that's fair? Yeah, yeah. We definitely see a range of anywhere from 6% of collections to 10% of collections. And it truly does depend on what services they're providing what the anticipation is of the entity's turnaround time, their accuracy. But we've seen where that range is generally anywhere from 6 to 10%, and that can be on portions of the MSO service okay. or the full collections of that MSO service. What happens to the revenue that's collected at the front desk or prior to a procedure like a pre-procedure deposit or something? Is that usually carved out from what the billing service takes? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Usually um, it's, it's based on that's considered, um, you know, self-pay or patient collections on the front end. And there are ways to carve that piece out. Um, and really when you're looking at collections, a lot of that 6 to 10% it's focused on um, claims collections. Mm -hmm. I do see some uh, focus on patient, but not as much as just the overall claims collections for most of those entities. When you're looking at an MSO service or a third party to just do your coding services, those can look a little bit different where if I'm just doing your coding and charge capture and I'm utilizing your system, we're billing on a case-by-case -case basis, or we're billing on a quarterly flat fee basis. So those can kind of vary depending on what service you're providing. But when you're looking at the overall billing function, the majority is based on collections of the claims. And so when you look at the measurements that you recommend for measuring uh, the performance, those are days and receivable, leg, claim lag, things like that. So you mentioned the claim lag earlier, or charge lag. Right. So charge lag, um, denial percentages, clean claims rate, and then, of course, your overall collections rate. 
And so if you've got these, watching those metrics every month and make sure that those are in line with where you want to be. And then what happens if you're not happy, like they're not performing well or, and you've tried to improve help them improve or you've done what the billing service has, has suggested and it's not working, how do programs get out or what do they do in that process of not being happy with the results? Yeah, I think, I think it's important that when you're looking at signing up with any of these entities that you definitely uh, look at uh, the language in your contract because you do want to have an out uh, to be able to transition back internally or to another company potentially so uh generally there's a 30 day some have a, to a 90 day out i've seen um but through that process i think for me is you know you want to be sure that you're going to them with the facts which include examples that are specific to what you're finding uh give them a chance to have an action plan and respond to that uh and if it continues you know, a second or, you know, a third time, then I would look at truly have they been yielding results and what is this impact to the organization? Um, because obviously switching a company or bringing it back in house, there's cost to that and there's mm -hmm. other considerations. So, you know, it's just be sure that you've given them enough information to have an action plan and respond to you, that they've had enough time uh, to respond to you, and then ultimately, if it doesn't work, don't let it go on for years. I would say <laughs> you want to be sure that you're staying on top of the results. That is great advice. Don't let it keep going on. I mean, three times, yeah. like you said, but having the action plan and giving them an opportunity to respond and to work together, because as you suggest, it's it's no easy feat to bring it back, just like it wasn't to put it out. You know, it's a lot of work for everybody. So that's really useful right. information. Um, anything else as we kind of head toward the exit door today? What else do you have? What are your sort of your parting thoughts to programs out there that are considering outsourcing? Um, I would say, you know, just making sure that you have those key things that we've talked about and then also knowing what you're looking for. I think setting those expectations and what your culture is, is important to share with third parties that you're bringing into your organization because you want them to have that same culture that you're trying to promote within your organization because that's definitely the foundation. Great, Nicole, thank you so much for your time today. We know you're, you're very busy, you're traveling a lot, so appreciate you spending some time with us at MedAxiom Hard Talk, thank you. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of MedAxiom Hard Talk. If you liked the conversation and topic you heard today, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And how about recommending MedAxiom Hard Talk to a colleague? Like you, we're always looking for more referrals, and we hope you'll consider rating us or writing a review on your podcast app. If you prefer to give us feedback directly or make a suggestion about future guests and topics, send an email to hardtalk.com at medaxium.com.